Welcome to Empire Building, the podcast where we talk about building big businesses and even bigger lives. I'm your co-host, Kimber lovett Minkiti. I'm Wendy Papazant. Kimber, you're really squeaky. <laughs> <laughs> I know, especially because we've done two episodes now. I feel like my poor voice, but yeah. I want to be you guys do it. You're squeaky. It's okay, we like got her though. And I'm Seychelle Van Poole. Welcome, guys. So we are um, entertaining today with the other side of real estate investing, which is the cons and the pitfalls and the things you want to be aware of when you are investing in real estate. So we're going to get into that with you all. And... Um, I am reminded of one of our properties. I'm telling y'all, I think it was um, Snake Bit, like or like someone put a hex on it before we bought it. Mm. If there, like, Ooh. if there was, and and this is only one out of the many we have owned, which is the best part. Most of ours have been fantastic, but we had there was one property that was like. The kids ran into the garage door with the Corvette. The we we dug up a forty pound underground beehive. Like someone kept washing your hair in the kitchen sink, and it made the whole kitchen disposal explode. Like it was like <laughs> different tenants. Like it was always one, this one. house, one yeah. house, and yeah. I mean. You name it, it happened. And it was only this house. So we ended up selling it because we just felt like the karma was giving us you were done. the reason you to do it. it. Yeah, we were, were like, done. this you is bad done. karma. Someone did yes. something to hex this house. But today we're really going to dive into what you want to know about real estate investing on the con side. Yeah. So welcome to part two of purchasing and accumulating rental properties. All right, now we're going to look at the other side of this, right? Because, yes, there's lots of upsides, and you want to go in eyes wide open for the, so it can be some of the cons. What are some of the challenges? And it, uh, it can be more work, right, than you might have signed up for. It can be hands-on. It can be, right, certainly if, you're, if you are handling the property manage of it directly because the toilet doesn't explode usually between 9 and 5. No, <laughs> it never does. Gonna happen. It, it never somehow does. never, ever works that way. No. Uh, and with college students, we learn lockouts, right, well before the days of the digital key. So, like, it, they were never getting locked out uh, at, like, 3 o'clock on a Monday. It was always, no. like, you know, at 1 o'clock in the Across the street, morning. knock, knock, knock. Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah, we're locked us? out. Sorry, we can't get in. Can you please help us? So the first one's really just understanding maintenance cost. As a landlord, you have to be prepared and have not just the cash flow from the property, right, but have the additional money set aside for those out-of-pocket maintenance expenses for your home repairs and upkeep, right? You want to understand what they are. Landlords often think about like a square footage as a model. I use sometimes a lot of where I can. I've got one property that is actually my great-grandmother's house that we bought. Aww. Many, many years ago. So to keep it in our family. And but it's, you know, it's about four hours away from me. So having mm-hmm. like one, both the contractor, but where I can, do I have like some some service yeah providers that can provide ongoing maintenance, right? So the HVAC, they're going to come in, they're going to service it, which is a cost to me, but hopefully will mitigate a big surprise out-of-pocket expense. So you want to assume that you're going to spend about a dollar for every square footage per year on maintenance. If you're just trying to like plug something into performance and think number. about what you should be mm-hmm. budgeting, it's a good number, right? So if you're renting out a 1,000 square foot apartment, you can estimate that you're going to pay roughly $1,000 in maintenance every year. And mm-hmm. just be prepared. It's why sometimes a condo like a, a upside of a condo or compartment, an apartment, a compartment <laughs> will actually be that, <laughs> that you've got less that you're actually going to be on the hook for. You're not like That's the Japanese real estate, real tiny apartments. They're exactly. compartments. Compartments. Yeah. Compartments. I like that. And, you know, the other thing to think about too is vacancies. Um, and, you know, an extended vacancy is undoubtedly, you know, it's one of the biggest financial risks because – if you have a mortgage on the property, you still are paying the interest, the principal, the taxes, and the insurance, whether somebody is living in the property or not. So, um, you know, areas that are, have high rentability is something to look at, right? What are the vacancy rates or like how many properties are available versus leased out and the areas that you're looking to purchase? And, you know, we've got a great story with uh, most of our tenants stay seven to 17 years in properties, but we've definitely had some. We had two we owned in a, a rougher part of town, but the cash flow was amazing. And um, this goes back to Wendy saying, what is your risk tolerance? Well, the cash flow was awesome up until month nine when the tenants stopped paying. And then we had to take three months to evict to them and then another couple of weeks to clean it out and then another month to rent it out. And then we were vacant for four and a half months. And then we would rent it again and they were great until month nine and then they would stop paying and then it would be again. So what looked like cash flow of 12 months was awesome actually became four and a half months every year of nobody in it. 
And that cash flow got real short, real quick when that was happening. So just be aware of like the area you're moving into, what the rentals look like, what, you know, what your tenant's background is coming into it. And don't like, do not profile, do not discriminate. That's not what we're telling you to do, but just look at their financial capability to pay because that that is a part where whether somebody's in there or not, or whether somebody's paying or not, you are still on the hook for the mortgage or the payment either way. Yeah. And the last one is just, there's a lot of other risks. I mean, first of all, it's the hassle factor. That's the thing I think most people think about when they think mm-hmm. about real estate is, is, ugh, I get a, I'm getting a phone call at two in the morning because the toilet's exploding. You're probably not going to be going over and fixing the toilet at two in the morning, but sometimes just getting the call is enough yeah. to make you go, ugh. Uh, but then of course, delinquent tenants, people that, you know, mess your place yeah. up. Um, the reality is, is, you know, we hear the horror stories of rental mm-hmm. properties. Nobody ever sits around the dinner table and talks about like how great their 17 year tenant was. Yeah. I mean, I love don't. them. So like, we're so thankful we, for them. So we hear great. the we hear the bad stuff. So just mm-hmm. understand like some of that noise that you might hear about it is is we just tend to hear the bad stuff. Um, and then you know larger economic instability. You know I know when COVID hit, the first thing I thought of was my friend Kimber. Uh, she's got a lot of commercial properties, and you know that if you've got a large portfolio of that, that can be kind of kind of scary. Um, and you know, real estate is the actual opposite of recession proof real estate's integr integr intimately involved with sort of what's going on in the larger financial world. And, um, you know, rents can go down, you know, rents can go down. I've owned property long enough where I've had, this is my second cycle of rents going down. Rents are going down in Austin right now. And that's tough. You know, you think rents are going to go up forever. So yeah, so there's plenty of other risks plenty of other risks too. Absolutely. So then you got to think about financing. How are you thinking about loan considerations and loan products? And this is where, right, finding a team in the area that you're uh, investing in is important, right? Because you want to understand the products and options that are out there. For the most part, investment loans are going to require 25% equity, right, down on the purchase price, really, or the appraised value. So they get a little bump, right, depending on what that appraised value is, depending on what product you're ending up using. But it is going to require, right, outside of our new, uh, this new multifamily, but you got to live there. If you're buying it just as an investment property, you're going to be looking at 20 to 30% down, depending on what what product you're using. Yeah. And that's just because banks want to mitigate their risk. You that's know, exactly banks always, right. the bank always wins, right? Yeah. No matter the economic environment, the, the banks gonna always win. win. <laughs> They're, They're always going to yeah. win. Yeah. And so if you've got a home that you're living in and you've got an investment property and you can only pay one of your mortgages, which one are you going to pay? There you mm-hmm. go. Absolutely. You're going to you're going to pay your you're going to pay the one you're living in and you're probably mm-hmm. going to let the other one go. So there's just more risk. So mm-hmm. uh, the bank wants you to have a lot more skin in the game, especially in a climate like this where interest rates are high, you know, economics are a little bit shaky out there. That's right. And thinking yeah. about like right you took conforming loan limits and so 10 properties mm-hmm. is what you can have, but that's properties in your name. So if you're buying mm-hmm. properties which has a whole different right both from a tax standpoint and just overall liability depending on the rest of your portfolio, do you own them in your individual name, do you own them in an LLC? That becomes a totally different exercise right when you're getting financing when there's an LLC that's sort of holding or wants to be in the position in that note holder position. One of our really really the strategy we use I think a lot of us have used was the cash out refinance, right? So if you're coming mm-hmm. in and you're getting like this became a way to fund these down payments. And so Mm -hmm. that was a lot of the strategy, especially if you were buying a depressed asset, distressed asset, then you were coming in, you were making improvements, you were stabilizing it, you got rents, right? When to give you that rental amount, that means, right, you may have been able to refi into a different product that allows Mm -hmm. for some cash flow. And so that was really very much our model. Stabilize the asset, get the tenant in, cash out, like, right, do the refine and put it right back in. And so that's how we kind of built up the portfolio in the early years using the equity to help build. And then also using lines of credit, getting with banks. There's ways that as you start to build your credit worthiness and relationships, this is where local banks can be a great, great resource Mm -hmm. when they Mm -hmm. understand your vision, what you're looking to do, how you're looking to build your portfolio. You know, we have a line of credit that also really dramatically changed our ability to start to also invest in commercial and multifamily assets and those really came out of long, longer term relationships with banks. That I think that's awesome. huge, Kimber. Like that's we huge. just, 
we didn't realize that like early on. Um, and the other way is to think about partnering on your, on your, maybe your first investment. I know a lot of our original investments that we were involved in, we had a partner involved. Absolutely. And I think sometimes we think, oh, we, we got to do it all alone. And the reality mm -hmm. is there's probably somebody out there who's looking for a deal. So if you have a deal, you have everything. Um, and mm -hmm. there's always people with money, but deals are a little harder to find. That's yeah. right. Money Especially finds good days. deals. So once you yes. have a good deal, money tends to find its way to the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. You know, and then the last part you want to consider, and we'll, we'll run through some of these rather quickly for you all, but it's, you know, your expenses can vary depending on your location and the size of the property and the type of the property that you have. So we'll pop through some of these real quick of just like expenses for you to think about so that you make sure you're budgeting appropriately. Um, but one, the first thing that I like to think about is what's my cash reserve? What am I reserving in cash? Um, because usually I like to have about six months in cash reserves of the rent um, set aside for each property that we buy. Again, I'm usually on the more conservative side with this. Um, but I like to have kind of a but cash Seychelle, buffer. But you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that for every property. If you had 50 properties, you wouldn't have six months of cash reserve for every property, would you? Um, no, but I probably would have at least three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. But that's that's because we... I got in in 06. I saw a lot of my friends lose mm -hmm. their shirts. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm going to be the, you know, and like in real estate right now, we're in real estate and a tough market. What happens? Rents are going down. Real estate is down, right? Like a lot of our partnerships and our businesses are down. And so you need cash all at the same time in all of your businesses, right? Like other businesses need cash calls. If you don't have a decent cash buffer, you can really hose yourself. And so um, I'm going to be more. I'm going to be more conservative on <laughs> did that because I want to sleep. Is that a term? Is that a thing? Podcast? I mean, I am. Yes, she did. <laughs> She's like, I, I am a product of. Is that a thing? I don't know. It's a thing. Um, oh man, I'm always making up phrases. Um, that's yeah. a that's a thing, right? It's a thing. Oh, it works yeah. totally. Yeah. I just haven't heard it in a while. Yeah. You're, you're bringing welcome. it back. You're bringing it I'm back. bringing it back. Yeah. Hey, mid nineties are in style. Quinn is dressing. That's true. And very mid-90s right now. And I'm true. like, what is happening? She's like, you threw away all your Doc Martens and stuff. I'm like, what? What do you want me to do with them? Um, I digress. So some of your expenses that you want to think about. So property taxes, depending on where you are, like we're invested in Michigan and Texas. Michigan, they take the property value, divide it in half, and that's what you get property taxed on. But you mm. also have like um, income tax that you pay. Versus Texas doesn't have income tax, but you're taxed on the whole property asset. Um, so you have to think about that with property taxes. Um, your mortgage payment, um, if the property is mortgaged, you do have to make monthly payments on that. No pay, no stay still applies. Still um, applies, yeah. Still Even applies. insurance is a no but pay. Insurance is going up. Yeah, it, is. Is it went up, up 36% last year. Yeah. 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 Well, especially if you're up. in Florida. That's right. Yeah. Flood insurance. Florida yep, is absolutely. really bad yeah. right now. Make sure you can yeah, actually get expensive. insurance on the property you're buying if you're buying in Florida. Like double check yeah, that. Yeah, 100%. percent Faux show. Um, you know, another thing is uh, utilities. Um, you might be responsible for paying some or all of the utilities or yard. So think about like water, gas, electricity, yard. Um, think about Especially in a big things. apartment building or multifamily. Yeah. A lot of times there's not separate meters for those. So that's one uh -huh. thing to think about. Also, it's like, oh, does mm -hmm. it have a separate meter? Is everybody yeah. going to be paying their own bills? 100%. Are you going to have to do that? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Right. And then your property yeah. management fees, right? So if you decide to go with a property manager, that's usually mm -hmm. 6 to 10%, depending on your area. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's fees if you're if the property manager is an identifying a tenant, that's usually one full month's rent. Yeah. So when you're looking at the cash flow, and if every single time a tenant turns over, you've got to pay that property manager to go release that. Yeah. You're, you just went down to 11 months rent, right? After uh -huh. your management fee. So sometimes it's not just looking at, hey, this is my, this is what the mortgage is and this is what I'm going to cash flow. You got to make sure you're taking out all those expenses. 100% yes on that. That makes yeah. perfect sense, Kimber. And then we talked about maintenance and repairs. Um, and then you've got sort of miscellaneous advertising and marketing, depending on probably if it's a single family home, mm -hmm. you might have to pay someone to you know, put it on the MLS for you if you're not a realtor. Mm -hmm. uh, then you got mm -hmm. legal fees, right? You might have to evic evict a tenant. Uh, Texas is a very landlord-friendly state. Yes. But a lot of states are not. Mm -hmm. so in the district, we are the complete opposite. We are tenant, tenant mm -hmm. friendly. So that's yeah. exactly right. You better have a, you know, you want to get a good lease in place. You want to make yep. sure you got a good tenant uh, attorney if you need it, if it comes to that. Yep. But yeah, yeah. Be ready. Yeah. Knock yeah. on wood. It's been it's been pretty easy here. We're very, very land. landlord okay. friendly. Yes, we are. Yeah. And our leases are very landlord friendly too. Yes. They Ours are, are not. Yeah. So know your local jurisdiction. 
Yeah. So come to Texas. Pay higher tax, come but you Texas. can evict. Come to Texas. <laughs> Do not come to the District of Columbia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we send them to the neighboring. We're like, we'll sell your house in, in Washington, D.C., and you'll invest in Maryland or Virginia. There you so go. So smart. Yeah, that yeah, makes so sense. Smart. Well, you guys, this has been really good today. It's This is a lot of information. So if you're newer to investing, you may want to listen to this a couple of times, take some notes. Don't do that while you're driving. Um, but we wanted to share with you all, we're so passionate about building a big business, which includes building wealth is a big part of it. So if you enjoyed this episode today, please leave us a five-star rating and review and let us know some of your stories about investing or questions that you have. You can send them to us on um, social media or each of us on Instagram. You can find us there as well. Um, We would love to help answer any questions that you have and be involved in your investing journey. And don't forget to go out there and build a big business, but more importantly, an even bigger life. Bye guys. Bye guys.